The use of treated wastewater for irrigation is becoming more of a necessity in many regions of the world, and the practice can have many benefits with regards to resource recovery. But in some regions, wastewater reuse is heavily regulated, perhaps to the point where its application is essentially discouraged. In other regions, the use of wastewater for irrigation is unsanctioned. Here, if wastewater reuse practices are carried out incorrectly, they can cause serious health risks for farmers, consumers, and their families. The trade-offs associated with water reuse and microbial health risks can be conceptualized with this image, where white represents microbial contamination of irrigation water. Pure water, without any microbial pathogens, is represented by the dark blue color. On the left side, where the color is nearly white, we can imagine a scenario where untreated wastewater is used for irrigation clearly very risky. On the right side, where the color is dark blue, we can imagine a scenario with extensive water treatment provided by a very expensive state-of-the-art facility with efficient disinfection, essentially eliminating microbial risk. This water would be safe to use for irrigation, but the cost of treatment may not be affordable or feasible. The challenge with developing appropriate wastewater reuse policies and practices is defining the grayish region in the middle, where an appropriate level of treatment is provided to reduce risks to levels that are both understood and accepted by the community. So what strategies can be used to estimate the risks associated with water reuse and to develop meaningful and appropriate policies and practices? We're going to provide a case study from the water-scarce Cochabamba Valley of Bolivia using quantitative microbial risk assessment to estimate the microbial health risks resulting from eating vegetables irrigated with wastewater. Quantitative microbial risk assessment, or QMRA, has been used in several different countries to inform policy and is recommended by the World Health Organization as a useful technique to develop guidelines related to the treatment of drinking water, the use of recreational waters, and the use of wastewater for irrigation. Here's how it works. Say we're irrigating lettuce with treated wastewater. First, we choose a reference pathogen, for example, human rotavirus. Then, we carry out an exposure assessment. For this case study, we are estimating the exposure that lettuce consumers have to rotavirus. To do the exposure assessment, we measure the concentration of rotavirus in the treated wastewater, then we estimate how much water ends up on the lettuce after irrigation. For example, we might weigh the lettuce when it's dry and then weigh it again when it's wet. We might also assume that all viruses in, the, in that water will attach onto the lettuce. Finally, after the lettuce is harvested, during the time it takes to transport the lettuce to the marketplace and eventually end up on someone's plate, the number of viruses on the lettuce might change. Some of the viruses might get inactivated or the lettuce may get recontaminated on its trip through the market into a person's home or to a restaurant. Also, the number of viruses on the lettuce can be reduced if the lettuce is washed before being served. The final part of the exposure assessment is to estimate how much lettuce is consumed and how often it is consumed. Finally, to estimate the risk, a dose-response relationship is used to predict the probability of infection given the estimated number of viruses ingested. This is done by fitting a model to data that is obtained from either an analytical or an experimental dose-response study. This allows us to estimate a probability of infection, or a distribution of this probability. Microbial risk assessment is one way to provide information about risk. If this information was provided to stakeholders in the society, could they potentially use it to develop appropriate policies and infrastructure to address wastewater reuse? If policies were developed, can they be effectively implemented in practice? The challenge of implementing policies and practices is often a question of coordinating responsibilities. The question of responsibility is a central concern for wastewater reuse. There are many levels where people or groups could be responsible for implementing, testing, and monitoring reuse practices. Broadly speaking, governments, transnational organizations, local communities, and individuals all could be responsible for choices related to wastewater reuse at these different levels. Governments may create policies related to risk acceptability or fund programs to help implement or monitor wastewater treatment infrastructure. 
NGOs may also provide support with this infrastructure or provide trainings to local communities. Communities or organized groups within a community may petition for aid from governments or NGOs or construct systems themselves. Individuals may provide localized infrastructure or train their families. However, problems can arise if these levels are not in clear communication. Furthermore, power structures and political issues may keep certain parts of the population from accessing the benefits of the wastewater treatment system as a whole. These structures could also make some people take on more burden of the systems, such as manual labor, health risks, costs, or social change. In the water-scarce Cochabamba Valley of Bolivia, many of the rivers are contaminated with untreated wastewater. Urban growth has increased rapidly over the past few decades, and in many neighborhoods, sewer collection systems have been installed without treatment, many of them discharging directly into the rivers. Some farmers downstream of the contamination have been irrigating with river water for generations, but as the quality of the river water started to decrease, Many of them implemented bank filtration systems to improve the quality of their irrigation water. Bank filtration systems essentially consist of shallow extraction wells located some distance away from the river, which allow water to pass underground through the banks of the river. The water is filtered by the alluvial soils. Pathogens and other contaminants are removed by a variety of mechanisms, including physical filtration, biological treatment, and ion exchange processes. This technique is used widely throughout the world as a way to treat or pre-treat surface water for water supply systems. Wastewater percolation ponds used for groundwater recharge also rely on the same treatment principles. In the year 2013, the Centro de Aguas y Saneamiento Ambiental de la Universidad Mayor de San Simón, in cooperation with the University del Sur de la Florida, ha llevado a cabo un estudio acerca del uso del agua residual para riego en la agricultura en el Valle Alto de Cochabamba. Uno de los objetivos del proyecto fue caracterizar el riesgo asociado con la transmisión de virus por el consumo de lechuga regada con agua residual. Se colectaron muestras de agua de una parte del río que atraviesa la ciudad y de varios pozos de filtración que contienen el agua para el riego de cultivos. Las muestras fueron analizadas en el laboratorio usando PCR cuantitativo con transcriptasa reversa para determinar la concentración de rotavirus humano. Altos niveles de rotavirus fueron detectados en las muestras del río, pero no se encontró rotavirus en las muestras de los pozos. Los indicadores clásicos E. coli y colifagos fueron detectados en las muestras de agua. Sin embargo, estos microorganismos pueden provenir también de los animales que merodean la zona y no necesariamente representan un riesgo para los humanos. Por otra parte, se encontraron parásitos patógenos, yardia, cripto y elmintos en algunas fuentes de agua, observándose valores mucho menores en las muestras de los pozos. Los resultados del estudio indican que los sistemas de los pozos están siendo efectivos en la remoción de los virus y reduce significativamente la concentración de parásitos. Mayores investigaciones son necesarias para confirmar estos resultados. Sin embargo, es importante dar a conocer los resultados preliminares a los agricultores de la zona, ya que con un mejor conocimiento ellos podrían disminuir el riesgo de contaminación en la producción de los cultivos. The next portion of our project was to conduct an exposure assessment to estimate the risk associated with consuming lettuce. We gathered data from lettuce consumers by conducting structured surveys in a market. We looked at the quantity of lettuce they bought, the quantity of lettuce they reported consuming on a weekly basis, and the ways that they treat their lettuce before eating it. We are adding in the specific consumption data from Bolivia to the QMRA model. In other studies, these models have been based on Western consumption data, but in this case, culturally specific consumption practices should improve the validity of the risk assessment. We also found from the surveys that individuals treat lettuce in a variety of ways. They treated lettuce with lime juice, iodine, chlorine, or rinsing with water. These differences could result in varying risks based on household level practices. 
We further found that there was a perception that lettuce farmed in the river it was dirty and contaminated, and so people were less likely to buy it. As we are unable to detect human rotavirus in water from bank filtration wells, there is a possibility that human rotavirus does not reach the consumer and lettuce irrigated with this water. Even if farmers are able to successfully treat the water used to irrigate their lettuce, though, effectively reducing risk, changing people's perceptions of the cleanliness of that region's crops may take time and focus before vendor livelihoods are restored.